It seems like it's been years since I placed my Black Friday order. When will it arrive? When will it come to me? When will I know the true meaning of emotion? Tell me. Tell me, world. When can I expect my sweet, sweet Blu-rays? My stack.
Hey guys, so uh, yeah, we're doing a new new thing here. Uh, I'm kind of just walking down the street right now. I just finished a very religious experience, and um, yeah, I'm gonna. This is welcome to the stack. It's the show where I talk about a stack of Blu-rays, and we're starting with vinegar syndrome. Now, I don't know why I'm talking like this or where I'm going, but. Uh, you know, welcome, welcome, welcome to the show, and uh, I guess uh, see you in my office when I when I find my my way back there. Now, as usual, I'll be reviewing these in order of my personal ranking for the film. So let's start off with my least favorite of this stellar package. Don't panic. Now I'm not sure what it is with Ruben Galindo Jr. movies and dumbass teens fucking around with the spirit world, but here we are once again with the third Vinegar Syndrome release of his work and the second of his trilogy of 80s horror efforts, Don't Panic, aka Dimensiones Occultes, Occultas, whatever. Our main boy, Michael, has just recently moved to Mexico, and during his birthday, his friends decide to screw around with a Ouija board, which, you know how that works. Now Michael winds up contending with strange dreams and visions while also getting his fuck on with this unibrowed honey. Also his eyes turn red, which sure is weird, but famously preventable. Clear eyes is a hit. Basically what we're given here is part Nightmare on Elm Street, part Poltergeist, and part, um, choose your own high school dramedy, really. Out of the three Galindo Jr. films, this is the only one I would classify as um, kinda bad in a traditional sense. There's a pretty hefty supply of unintentional laughter to be had here, especially in regards to Michael's choice in pajamas, which he spends roughly a third of the film running around in. Here he is being accosted by a teen with a shotgun and all I can see are those goddamn dinosaurs. There's also the ludicrous love story punctuated by a heavy emphasis on the power of a rose, which is just so strange and also so delightful. Characters talk business and corporations with hilariously little in the way of specifics. Outlandish visuals are scattered all over. Production design is, yeah. And there's even a theme song. <laughs> Just bounce your dick to that one. Ooh, ooh. Uh, there's also this wonderfully off kilter moment with the demonically possessed killer popping up in the back seat of a car, which. Just watch it. <laughs> right? There's some ringtone material right there. Anyway, Galindo Jr. Galindo. Galindo Jr builds up to a lovely little chase sequence through a seemingly deserted Mexico City and culminates in a finale that's extremely somber, uh, shockingly so, after such a bonkers flick. Well, until he tacks on one last strange note that I, I won't spoil here. Suffice it to say, this is a 
Bounkers flick, and while it's at the bottom of my list for this particular stack, it still comes with a very strong recommendation. Leave me alone! No! Ruben Galindo Jr. does have at least three more horror flicks lensed in the 90s, according to his IMDb. So, uh, you know, uh, get to work, Vinegar Syndrome. Bring me Galindo Jr. films. I don't care if he's a finite resource, I want more! Anyway, on to the extras. First off, we do get both English and dubbed Spanish language soundtracks on this region-free disc. Uh, our single featurette, Possessed by Horror, is a 24-minute interview with Ruben Galindo Jr. Uh, once again in the same setup as the previous interviews. He talks about the film's intended markets, how the idea sprang from wanting to do a movie centered around a Ouija board, working with Screaming Mad George, uh, the origins of those pajamas, and plenty more. One small note, lots of plosives throughout this one, uh, which is basically just the p -p 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 sound, and like when it hits a mic and it, it kind of like pops, it's a plosive. So audio guide, maybe next time, don't place the lav so close to the subject's mouth, just throwing it out there. Uh, we also get two commentaries, one by Roban Galindo Jr. and another by The Hysteria Continues. Uh, now, unfortunately, I was only able to skim through these commentaries, so I can't really give a final verdict on them, but first of all, Two fucking commentaries gets me all hot and bothered. And secondly, at the very least, the boys over at Hysteria Continues have proven time and time again to be extremely adept at these suckers. Playing through both, I picked up on a bunch of useful factoids and analysis, with the Hysteria commentary sounding slightly more full and energetic. Uh, beyond those, we also get alternate Spanish titles for all you perverts out there. Uh, the scan is, of course, of the original 35mm negative, which does show some wear and tear in places, but nothing aggressive. For art, we get a, a lovely slipcover. Uh, it's uh, stylistically very similar to the previous two Galindo Jr. releases, which is also um, included on the first side of the insert. Uh, and then flipped, we get the original poster artwork for Don't Panic. Um, yeah, it, it looks beautiful. It's uh, another great slip, not surprisingly. Uh, and I think, I wanna say that they're all I'm pretty sure these are all camera negative. You know what, I'll just tell you if uh, if it's not from the camera negative, because they're all, it's, it's what Vinegar Syndrome does. For most of these releases, uh, there is some damage, and if there is damage to the print that was like impossible for them to get around, uh, they have added notes at the beginning. I feel like this is kind of a new thing. Like I've seen uh, notes at the beginning of Vinegar Syndrome releases before, explaining that certain things just couldn't be taken care of because the source material was damaged or whatever. A bunch of these, especially the Forgotten Jolly set and Beastmaster, they have little notes. None of it was terribly distracting for me. You definitely see some of the damage here and there, but overall, just to just so I don't like repeat myself too much, all of these look great, bearing in mind certain source issues. But you'll see that I'm gonna have plenty of. You know, I have plenty of uh, video going this throughout this whole thing. You can see that it's, they all look really great. Grain fluctuation here and there, some damage here and there, but I wouldn't say it's anything awful. I think if you have any serious problems with the presentation of the films themselves, then, um, I don't know, go get laid. As long as there's love between you and I, this rose will never wither. Anyway, next up, uh, I don't necessarily think the film by itself is better than Don't Panic, but thanks to several notable elements and what I feel is a slight bit more consistency, let's talk Silent Madness. Yeah, you mean the sorority slaughter. Please, Cheryl, I don't want to hear about that. <laughs> From Savage Dawn director Simon Nuchtern, or Nuchtern, they definitely say his name in like several things and I totally don't remember how the fuck, anyway, uh, Simon Nuchtern, uh, comes the 3D release that many, many, many horror fans have been yearning for since seemingly the dawn of time, and finally, here it is. Uh, some folks are not going to feel the hype was worth it, but still others will see it for its silly, fun glory. Either way, it's a beauty that's finally gotten its due on disc. Uh, Silent Madness, uh, it follows a psychiatrist doctor, played by Belinda Montgomery, who takes it upon herself to retrieve escaped lunatic Howard Johns after a computer error leads to his incredibly unlikely release from an asylum for the criminally insane. Dr. Gilmore here made the point that Romano was unprepared for release. Dr. Anderson probably thought it was too soon for John as well. Well, I hope you're right, Doctor. 
It'll be a shame to prevent this man. He heads to the sorority house where he originally perpetrated a series of grisly murders, and it's up to our intrepid hero, along with her journalist sidekick slash love interest, to save the day. First things first, the 3D here is surprisingly effective, and although there aren't as many sight gags as you'd expect, the ones we're given are pretty sick, while the rest of Silent Madness is given a fantastic level of depth. Important note though, I watched about an hour of the film with the Anaglyph 3D, meaning the red and cyan version, and while it did give me a good idea of the 3D um, quality, it also was really hard to watch. Anaglyph 3D and, and these eyes, they just don't mix very well. I also don't own a 3D TV, so I wasn't able to partake in the proper 3D release that Vinegar Syndrome has provided. Now regarding all the stuff that you freaks and weirdos uh, care about, there's, a, there's, there's very little bloodshed here. Uh, if you're triggered by toxic work environments, then this is gonna be a tough ride, but there's something polished and fun about the lighting and tone. It feels like a film that's much smarter than it appears, and speaking of appearance, uh, it's great to look at. Uh, Gerald Fa Feel? File? I don't... Oh, fuck, I'm so bad at names. Uh, Gerald Feel... We're gonna say Fail? I'm gonna say Fail. Gerald Fail, uh, who had previously shot Friday the 13th Part 3 and would go on to lend Savage Dawn, does a phenomenal job here. And in my opinion, he far exceeds his work on Friday the 13th Part 3. I think this is a really just nice to look at film. There's a lot of, like, uh, heavily gelled lights, uh, a lot of atmosphere, uh, very, very intentional lighting, which with 3D, you kind of have to have that kind of lighting. I mean, you, you can't just say fuck it. You really have to put a lot of attention on the lights and, and in the extras, they kind of go over this a bit more. Uh, but, you know, that's, I guess, the one big benefit of 3D movies uh, aesthetically is even though they do have that like weird sort of um, distortion on the sides, you know, the kind of ghosting 3D lenses, uh, they have to be lit well. So that's pretty That's pretty cool. Our Killer Johns is played by stuntman Solly Marks. Uh, he has a wonderfully finicky yet brutal way of dispatching of his victims, and it's just, it's a delight to watch him work. Sure, he's not a traditional masked maniac, but this just winds up being one of the many things that helps Silent Madness stand out from the rest of the slasher pack. It's very welcome, because most of the film is really just characters talking and dealing with melodrama, which isn't Real, it's not its not the least entertaining thing in the world, but if you're watching in 3D, then the increased depth should make those scenes more entertaining. And if you're like me and watch the 3D while aggressively high, ooh boy, you're in for a treat. Uh, we also get a turn from Sidney Lassick as a pretty ineffectual sheriff, uh, and Vivica Linfors, uh, or Linford, whatever, as the sorority's mysterious, emotionally unbalanced matriarch. Silent Madness, it's not a perfect flick, but it's entertaining enough with characters, cinematography, and little quirks that provide plenty to separate it from its contemporaries in the horror genre. Our sorority girls are a fun bunch, the setting is unique and needlessly large, and there's even a brief appearance by the lovely Elizabeth Caitan. Caitan? Caitan? Caitan. Caitan. I've heard it like 17 different ways. Let's say Caitan. Caitan. Caitan? Elizabeth Caitan. Caitan? Whatever, she's hot. Uh, who apparently lied her way into a brief role as a skateboarding woman who meets a grisly end. Uh, and that's a bit of trivia I learned in the extras, so let's uh, let's segue over to those. Uh, first off, as I mentioned, we get three versions of Silent Madness. We get digital 3D, anaglyph 3D, uh, with two pairs of provided glasses, and flat 2D. Much like with Don't Panic, we get two commentaries, one with Simon Nocturne, uh, moderated by Michael Gingold, and one with The Hysteria Continues. The latter is a standard commentary by those boys and extremely worthwhile, while the Nocturne commentary, uh, it sounds as if it was recorded over Skype or maybe it just was in like some poor conditions. Either way, uh, it's usable, just not great, but the content is certainly worthwhile. Hysteria gets a few more points though, if only because of the quality issue and their lack of silent spots while I was scanning through the two commentaries. Method to the Madness is a 45 minute documentary on the making of the film, mostly talking heads and behind the scenes photos. It's a very informative piece and I'd love to see more like it from future releases. Uh, if it's not quite enough for you, we also get some deleted footage from the interviews. Uh, that adds like six minutes of material. Uh, and overall, it's very informative. I mean, between those interviews and the commentaries, oh my God, so much. Uh, Silent Stalking Grounds is a locations featurette hosted by Michael Gingold. Uh, it's similar to the one he did for Scream Factory's Friday the 13th box set. 
It's a solid 11 minutes, which among other things helps to explain just how freaking huge that fucking boiler room is. Why is it so big? Uh, well, you find out because of where they shot it, but that, that is a fucking huge boiler room. I think it's the worst, the, the worst that, not even the worst thing, but like the thing that stands out most about Silent Madness isn't the 3D or the wacky uh, killer. It's the fact that the fucking boiler room for the sorority house is so fucking huge. It is massive, so much bigger than it needs to be. Anyway, the intro by Simon Nocturne, they they talk about it on the uh, back of the disc. Uh, it's it's 26 seconds, so not much there. I find usually if there's a director intro, it's not there's not much to go there. Um, I, I kind of wish they would have the directors like do like proper, you know, like a couple minutes worth introductions. That'd be pretty cool. But this one. Yeah, it's fine. We also get a promotional 3D sizzle reel that at 18 minutes is far more palatable for my, my poor eyes. So if you want to experience the 3D without sitting and staring at it for an hour and a half, uh, there you go. There's also a still gallery and uh, capital M, multiple, mm, multiple radio spots. Just in, oh, just in case you want hard nipples in a long night. Mm, mm -hmm. The actual uh, case, by the way, uh, looks pretty, pretty fucking sick. Look at that. Look at that shit right there. Pretty cool stuff. You I forgot the glasses were in. So as you can see, you get two versions of the artwork right there, um, which I think that uh, the this this work is so, this is so much better. Um, although it does suggest that they're in the woods, and they're never in the fucking woods. Uh, that's something I always thought was a, a thing with Silent Madness, but it's not. Uh, as far as the three D glasses, you can kind of see. Uh, hey, yeah, look at that. Oh my god. Oh, I'm dying. Oh, this hurts so much. Oh, oh, fuck. Oh my god. But they are branded with Silent Madness jazz, so that's pretty cool. You know, if, if you're into this kind of 3D, sick as hell, man. Sick as hell. It's just not really, not really for me so much because I'm old and my eyes don't work no good no more. So great packaging there. doop a doop a doop Next up. Forgotten Jolly, Volume 2. Bah. Uh, the follow-up to Volume 1, which was released way back in April, which honestly feels like years ago at this point. Uh, like that set, we get three films in the collection. So this time they are uh, a little more well-known and honestly, uh, better. I'm just gonna say it. Like, I really like that first volume, but um, these this is great. The films themselves are a somewhat mixed bag, and I definitely... Uh, place my bottom entry uh, below Don't Panic, but as a whole it's a delightful sort of potpourri of uh, Jalo. And just to be super clear, uh, this first one, I don't dislike it at all. Like Don't Panic is a really solid film, so me putting this below that is not anything against this movie. It's just if I was to rate these all like not as releases, but just as individual films, it'd definitely be slightly below Don't Panic, just because it has a lot more flaws. But anyway, uh, first up, Girl in Room 2A. Yes, sir, Bob. Uh, this one is very much a psychologically focused giallo, uh, a la like all the colors of the dark, that kind of thing, complete with a heroine dealing with visions and a murderous cult. Unfortunately, it doesn't have that Sergio Martino touch or the magnetism of, say, Edwige Fenech, uh, but it makes up for that by being pretty fucking goddamn sleazy. This, this isn't too surprising, since it's one of the two films in this set produced by notorious schlockmeister Dick Randall. Uh, we'll get to him in a bit, though. Suffice it to say, while this is a predominantly Italian production, it was produced and directed by a pair of Americans from New York who had cut their teeth on much seedier fare. So it is missing some of that Italian uh, class is a strong word. You know, that kind of, that, that extra little bit of professionalism. Oh, and I, I mentioned Martino at the beginning. Uh, star Daniela Giordano uh, also appears as Fausta in uh, Your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key. Uh, here she plays Margaret, a young woman recently released from prison who goes to stay at a halfway house for ladies of the ex-con variety. Of course, the halfway house holds a disturbing, perhaps even murderous secret, and Margaret finds herself plagued by nightmares and strange happenings. Soon, she befriends a man looking for a sister who went missing after staying at the house, leading us into a mystery dealing with a mysterious cult, uh, a red hooded figure, and some good old-fashioned torture. 
Now this is probably the least interesting of the bunch in this set, but it comes with plenty of amenities. In addition to the cult plot, we get a fashionable masked killer, some solid chemistry between our two leads, yeah, and plenty of sadomasochism befitting such sleaze-obsessed filmmakers. Uh, as far as extras, we get English and Italian dubbed versions. We also get an 11 minute archival interview with Daniela Giordano, uh, wherein the actress talks her career, working with various directors, including Paul Nashi, for whom she appeared in Inquisition, uh, and some specific memories, including a brief bit about Dick Randall, although she doesn't really go into a lot of details about the guy. She gives a very brief description. Uh, that's a good interview. Uh, there's also an 18 minute audio essay by Rachel Nisbet. Uh, it's a solid analysis, but it's another one of those, those, those fucking goddamn uh, just, just audio segments with an kind of uninspired clip show in lieu of any actual editing. And like, guys, if you wanna send one of us like thirsty ass editors uh, an audio file and some directions, we'll, we'll take care of it, guys. Like, we'll take care of you. Just, just send it out, you know, come, Hundred bucks, we'll fucking, we'll take care of you, man. You don't need to do this. You can, you can have like an actual video essay on there. It's fine. Like it's totally cool. You can make it a proper video essay. Come on. Anyway, uh, it's it's a very good essay, uh, but could definitely have used a little more attention in post. Uh, beyond all that, we get the original trailer sourced from tape and a still gallery. And as you can see here, pretty simple stuff um, with the actual artwork. Um, a little bit of sadomasochism on the other side there. So anyway, My Dear Killer is easily the most refined of the bunch, uh, probably because it wasn't produced by Dick fucking Randall. This one's directed by Tonino Valeri, uh, who's much more well known for his westerns My Name Is Nobody and Day of Anger. Uh, it's not quite as stylish as many of its more popular brothers and sisters, but it nonetheless looks great. Features a typically seductive performance by George Hilton, uh, with love interest George Hilton's mustache really just providing award-worthy acting chops. Anyway, My Dear Killer has the kind of opening sequence that makes you wonder why every movie can't start with a dude being picked up and decapitated by construction equipment. It's a pretty dope way to start off and immediately grabs your attention. The rest of the movie isn't nearly as bonkers, but the mystery at play is fairly gripping, although the conclusion is one of those that makes you go back and try to remember if the clues actually led this way, or if the writer was just pulling a twist out of his ass. The plot itself is pretty simple when you, once you strip it of the twists. There's a murder, dude investigates, there's another murder, dude investigates some more, dude discovers a conspiracy is afoot surrounding the kidnapping and murder of a young girl, bada bing, bada boom, it's a giallo. Uh, and a very good one, too. Uh, very, very, very good giallo. Uh, I don't think it's quite as good as some people say, but I also don't think it's as bad as others say. I'm very, I'm kind of in the middle leaning towards very good. Uh, but it definitely has some shortcomings and is not as rewatchable as um, a lot of the more notable uh, films in the genre. There's a short scene involving a young naked girl that I guess is meant as a potential red herring, but it's not aged particularly well and might cause some discomfort in your audience, so just be aware of that. Um, I don't think it's that big of a deal, uh, but it, it is kind of weird, especially now. It's very, it's aged badly. <laughs> But that's that's a very brief shot. Small technical note, subtitles are a little janky on this release. Uh, I didn't look watch the subtitles for everything, but this one is primarily in Italian. I'm only saying primarily, it is in Italian. So I, I watched the subtitles and it's nothing too serious, but whoever did them forgot to separate different characters' dialogue for a large chunk of the film, meaning lines run into each other uh, pretty often. So, you know, that's a little frustrating. Nothing egregious, but I have found that uh, Vinegar Syndrome t subtitles in general tend to have a few issues here and there, but it's never anything like, you know, super bad, just a little distracting in those moments. Extras on this one are both slim and chalky at the same time. Uh, we get an Italian and English version with the latter sourced from tape. Uh, I didn't watch the English version in full, so I'm not sure why it couldn't be adapted to the new transfer, but I'm assuming that the reasoning is there, otherwise they would have just made it a different track. Uh, I did skim through and it's totally watchable, so that's dope. Just, you know, doesn't look as good uh, as the actual transfer. We also get a 40 minute interview with writer Roberto Leone uh, and a 13 minute archive interview with George Hilton and director Tonino Valeri. I feel like I'm, I'm just insulting so many Italians. 
with these. Anyway, uh, I didn't finish the Leone interview for the sake of time, but I really enjoyed listening to Valeri uh, explain one of the film's more um, gruesome special effects. I thought it was a really interesting and uh, smart solution to that scene. And yeah, that, that's it. That's it's uh, it's a really solid effort. I really like this. Like, I'll definitely be revisiting this. Um, you know, I yeah, you can see the boop a doop a doop. Not too crazy on the alternate artwork, but it's perfectly fine. Also, honestly, like, are you really going to be seeing the artwork for these very often? You're going to have the box, like, them in the box rather, like, at all times. So I don't really have an issue with the art being a little. It's not even subpar or anything. It's just not as inspired as some other pieces. But yeah, I really, I really enjoyed this release. This is definitely, uh, I think if it weren't for the underage child nudity that just is thrown in, uh, then we'd probably be, this would probably be like a great early step in someone's giallo education. So if you think that's not going to bother them, then this is a good one to show like people who are early in their uh, appreciation of the genre. Otherwise, maybe save it for a bit or, you know, give them a spoiler warning or something. Anyway, I know you've heard of Bruce exploitation, but what about bogey exploitation? Well, that's the subgenre I'm applying to the French Sex Murders, the second in this set produced by exploitation pioneer Dick Randall, who actually did produce some Bruce exploitation flicks. I don't know why I'm talking like this. Ooh. This sucker stars Robert Sachi. Saki? Sachi? Sachi? I'm gonna say Sachi. Sachi? Fuck. I know I've. You know, what's crazy about these names is I have listened to people talk about them multiple times now. Because I've watched at least chunks, if not the entirety, of all these extras. And they have talked about this dude so many times. And my brain is so shot to hell. Uh, and my grasp of foreign names, international names, is so bad that I cannot remember the, the, how to actually pronounce them. Not that he's, you know, his name is, is Italian, but uh, I think he was, he's like from the Bronx or something. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, stars Robert Sacchi, who is most well known as basically the Humphrey Bogart impersonator. Uh, here, all but taking credit as the man himself. The rest of the cast is insanely impressive and features names like uh, Dr. Olaf himself, Howard Vernon, Barbara Boucher, uh, briefly, and Anita Ekberg. For a film with such a sleazy title, it managed to nab some truly stellar talent while also still being extremely sleazy. It's so sleazy and so weird. In in the commentary, uh, they mention, some, one of the ladies mentions that it feels more like a Jess Franco flick than the proper Giallo, and that is 100%, 100%. It is so weird and has so many just bizarre choices, both in the script and the direction. It's weird as fuck. The plot itself concerns a brothel, of course, where a prostitute has been murdered. The prime suspect is discovered and sought almost immediately by Detective Fontaine and his crew, but while escaping the cops and in turn death by guillotine, uh, he winds up dying via high-speed decapitation. Posthumously, uh, his eyes are given to a strange doctor, and at the same time, uh, those who are, uh, who sort of um, implicated him or had something to do with the implication of him uh, start to wind up dead. Uh, is it the man's vengeful spirit? Is there another killer on the loose? Watch to find out! <laughs> so yeah, uh, delightfully macabre setup here. Utterly insane and uh, all the way through. It's never quite as wild as, say, Pieces, but it's a warped, admittedly not super surprising mystery that's chock full of sex and violence, the latter of which is often filmed and edited in the strangest ways, including this weird multicolored series of monochromatic shots and a finale that's just... Hmm. I could probably go on, but honestly, just... Just watch this movie. The whole set's worth it, and French Sex Murders just, it, it wraps it all up so nicely. Um, you can see, I prefer this, this I believe this is the alternate artwork. Um, you can kind of see here that uh, Humphrey Bogart looking motherfucker right up top. Uh, as far as extras, as with the other two releases, we get both English and Italian dubbed soundtracks. Uh, we also get two pretty sick extras. The first is a historical commentary track by Kat Ellinger and Sam Deegan. Again, again, I, I didn't have time to delve into everything, 
And this is another track I had to skim through, but it was very challenging to stop myself from just saying screw it and listening to the whole thing. These ladies are always lovely to listen to, and this seems like another great example of that. Tons of historical information about Euro cult history, uh, and yeah, I, um, I I really need to go back and finish listening because it's 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 great. Um, I feel like I just feel like a broken record with these because most commentary tracks that we get from Vinegar Syndrome are solid as fuck. So this is just another, add it to the pile. Uh, throw it up there on top of the pile. We'll get to it eventually. Now, uh, The Wild Wild World of Dick Randall is a 32 minute documentary on the career of producer Dick Randall. And while it's pretty cheaply produced, it's a fascinating look into the world of a guy who was quite the character. Uh, among his many accomplishments, Dick Randall produced uh, Mario Bava's Four Times That Night, Juan Piquetter Simone's uh, pieces, uh, For Your Height Only, the, um, diminutive send-up of For Your Eyes Only, and the previously released through Severin, Mondo Flick, The Wild Wild World of Jane Mansfield, uh, as well as so many others. Like, there's just a fucking massive amount of films that this dude produced. He was a total exploitation demigod, and this doc was a fascinating glimpse into his world. Uh, it also added a lot to my watch list. Uh, I do kind of wish it was a more recent documentary, and I also wish it was longer but I mean, it's still really good. Oh, and we also get a stills gallery. So there, there's that. And uh, I, man, I just really, really, really enjoyed this set. Um, they're all winners, honestly. I just have my preferences. Uh, God damn, I love this fucking month so much. So yeah, Forgotten Jolly, volume two, cannot wait for a third, fourth, fifth, fucking 97th volume. Keep them coming, Vinegar Syndrome. Keep them fucking coming because this is the kind of shit I subscribe for. I think I actually, I mentioned that last time with volume one. This is why I subscribe. Shit like this is what keeps me coming back, man. So uh, keep up, keep it up. Next up, what could it be? Could it be Fade to Black? <laughs> Eric is a real fucking nerd. Dude loves movies to a degree that even a massive fucking movie nerd would find a little much. He lives with his aunt, has the social skills of a chainsaw and a chicken coop, and works at a film distribution business with Mickey Rourke. Needless to say, he's a bit of a creeper. I, I don't know what Mickey Rourke has to do with being a creeper, but young, young Mickey Rourke is in this. I, I, got, I, I gotta mention it somewhere. Anyway, uh, Dennis Christopher's turn as Eric is one of those performances that is shockingly good and really shows that the industry missed out by not pushing him into bigger roles. Fade to Black is, is one of those movies that really just exceeds expectations, I think. Plenty of people have expressed disappointment, but for me, the fact that it's so much more than a slasher and really not even a straight horror movie as much as a thriller is pretty great. Uh, a big part of that is that it contains so many horror elements and iconography without being the hokey horror flick that you might expect when you see the poster or read the tagline, which again, might disappoint some people. And you know, I was certainly prepared for a more out there slasher flick, but still, like when you just get like a, a standard great film, cool, 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 cool. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, albeit flawed character study in the vein of Taxi Driver or Christmas Evil uh, that delves into the dark side of fandom with extreme accuracy and darkness. In fact, I'm gonna throw this out there and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get a little, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a little pushback, but uh, better than The Fanatic. Yeah, it's that, it's that good. Poppycock. Now, if I have one big issue with Fade to Black, it's the editing. Uh, there's a lot of plotting in the sucker that leaves a lot of questions. Uh, some of these come down to our boy's psychosis. Uh, for example, at one point, he just shows up to pay homage to Psycho at Marilyn's home, but there's no precedent for him knowing where she lives, and the scene doesn't actually lead anywhere. Uh, now this could just be him in his own little world, but based on some script knowledge dropped during a commentary track, it seems like it was just the victim of cuts to a drug subplot. Basically, you know, he was taking, I guess, um, anti-crazy pills and it fucked him up and he somehow found Marilyn's house. Like it, it isn't, th there's a lot of editing issues here that just, it, they create serious logic flaws that I, I can understand some people letting those get to them. Personally, as a fan of, you know, I've already mentioned it, Jess Franco, uh, 
I'm, I'm okay with some logic issues, so they didn't really bother me, but I can definitely see if you want like an airtight uh, plot, this is definitely not that. Uh, now, there's also the psychologist working with the cops, played by Tim Thomerson, who legit feels like he was added in during second unit to pad out the runtime, even though I know he wasn't. Um, that's just how it feels. Like until until he and Dennis Christopher wind up in the same general shot, or at least the same scene, uh, I, I legitimately thought this was some weird, like we gotta add a detective subplot to pad it out or to like get an international audience or something. Like that's what it feels like. So that that's a little frustrating because it just doesn't, it doesn't add to the film enough. It feels tacked on. Uh, and I feel like we really could have just kept it to just Eric and his infatuations and been fine. Now, uh, let's talk extras. First up, we get a commentary by Dennis Christopher, moderated by the one and only Brad Henderson, whom I'm sure was just so put upon when tasked with this gig. Uh, I've of course mentioned several times that I've had to scan through most of this Spoil of Riches bundle, uh, and this is another one where I just wanted to sit back and listen to the whole thing. As it is, I listened to the first 20 minutes, came, and look forward to piecemealing my way through the rest. Uh, Dennis Christopher is very generous in discussing the details of the shoot and helps to explain some of the issues inherent in it. I'm very curious to hear him talk about uh, other moments later in the film. I just didn't have time. Uh, a second commentary by The Hysteria Continues is, as usual, both extremely informative and entertaining. Early on, they described the film as a West Coast version of Maniac, and that right there is a, is a great description. I think if it had gone uh, closer to that Maniac energy, I think it would have actually been a little bit better as a film. Uh, and sure, Fade to Black isn't quite as sleazy, but it does feature a prolonged masturbation scene, so, you know, not too far off. Uh, I watched almost the entire film with this commentary while trying to wrangle my son, and it proved to be a very entertaining distraction. And if those two great selections weren't enough, we get a historical commentary by film historians Amanda Reyes, I don't know why I said, anyway, uh, and Bill Ackerman. I listened to 10 minutes, it's a far more standard issue commentary. They list off facts and observations, probably from a whole heap of prepared notes, and discuss Fade to Black in a more academic sense. Taken all together, these three commentaries provide enough for just about everyone. Great stuff. Uh, for the sake of brevity, uh, I'm not gonna dig too far into the interviews on this disc. Suffice it to say that they are really solid, all-encompassing interviews. If you like Fade to Black, you'll find these, at worst, to be fairly entertaining and probably super informative. Um, so anyway, Living and Dying for the Movies is a 17-minute interview with Dennis Christopher, who is aged into a pretty comfortable 1960s drug dealer, apparently. He does that thing where actors denigrate slasher flicks and horror movies in explaining how elevated the project is, but, you know, I guess he's not entirely wrong, at least as far as the genre of the film goes, so, whatever. Uh, anyway, it, it's a great interview, including his story of an alternate ending that was sadly unused, uh, that would have been great. Celluloid Heroes is a whopping 26-minute interview with executive producer Erwin Yablans. Yablans? Yablans? Yablans. Erwin Yablans. Erwin Yablans? Yablans. Erwin Yablans? Whatever. Uh, for whom Fade to Black was a follow-up to his work on Halloween. This one's fucking fantastic and doubles as a sort of compact retrospective on his early career. He does also briefly do the downplaying horror thing, but whatever. Dude produced Halloween. Fuck it. Taking the Hits is an 11 minute interview with special effects artist Wayne Beecham. Uh, a Shining Quality is an 18 minute interview with Marcy Barkin, who plays Stacy. Experimenting with Sound is a 12 minute interview with composer Craig Saffin, uh, which is fairly standard issue and informative. And I should add, the music in this movie is fucking sick. So good shit getting this Saffin interview. Uh, finishing the story is an eight minute interview with editor Barbara Pokris? Pokris? Pocris, but whatever. I'm just not gonna get names right, and if you have a problem with that, uh, go get fucked. So this interview is, uh, it's good, but it didn't answer the questions I had about the film's strange editing choices, unfortunately, which I was a little saddened by, but whatever. She's, she's fun to listen to. Uh, a Brush with Darkness is a 14 minute interview with stylist Patricia Bunch, who has a Fade to Black poster next to her for some reason, outside, in, in front of a lake, which, cool. Uh, rounding out the big boy extras, we get a 31 minute audio interview with Linda Carriage with Brad Henderson on interviewer duty. She talks about her resemblance to Marilyn Monroe and working on Fate to Black, among other things. 
Uh, we also get a stills gallery and the original theatrical trailer. Guys, this is a truly phenomenal release, and in any other month, it would easily be the best of the best. Uh, it's a great film, great special features. I mean, come on, three commentaries? It's practically rigged. However, I have to give top marks to another film, even though, like, look at this. This is some sexy-ass artwork. Oh, it looks so good, so classic. I love it. It, 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 it it's just beautiful. You got that 30, that, that original negative print. You get so fucking sexy. It's beautiful, but I gotta give the top, top of the top. You already know what it is. The Beastmaster. Holy shit. Now, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna go through the packaging first, because this is beautiful. Uh, so you get this box, and uh, you open the sucker up. Look at that. And uh, you get all this artwork inside. It looks fucking beautiful. Uh, you get a booklet. And, you know, there's some essays and junk in here. Nothing you're, is gonna really, you're gonna, like, learn from, but it's a very nice, uh, well-made booklet. And then you get your slip cover. So if you don't, if you, if for some reason, like, if this is too much, like, if you think, like, this is just, this is not gonna fill in your shelf properly, like, maybe your um, Blu-rays are fitted very snugly in the, in the shelf, um, that's fine. You get a standard Blu-ray. Uh, beautiful. Look at that fucking, that fucking body there. Uh, oh my god. Uh, some beautiful stuff on the back. And then you bring it on out of its case. Nice 4K Ultra HD. Um, you get another option for artwork. There's just so much artwork fucking on display here. And it's three disc, three discs, uh, 4K UHD, which I, I was not able to rip the 4K UHD. Uh, long story of how that works, but basically I just, I couldn't do it. So all the footage you're seeing is from the Blu-ray. Uh, but trust me, the 4K looks a fucking sick. You get two Blu-rays, uh, and, uh, yeah, this is, let's see, let me get this right. It was, let's see, newly scanned and restored in 4K from its 35 millimeter inner positive. Uh, some of it does not look perfect. It is a little beaten up here and there. Um, but honestly, like, for the most part, looks pretty sick. So uh, this, like, just from a physical standpoint, this is damn near perfect. But what about the movie? Beastmaster. Basically, it's Eliza Thornberry, but buff. Yeah. Uh, do I need to explain the plot of Beastmaster? It's 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 your standard sword and sorcery tale of a young man forced by tragedy into a journey to prove himself and kick lots of ass while communicating with animals and harassing slave girls. Good fucking times. The best thing about Beastmaster is that it really just fucking goes for it. Don Coscarelli finally had a proper budget and God damn it, he was going to make a fucking fantasy epic. Not surprisingly, that includes some frankly pretty fucked up shit and it's great and really scarring for children. Uh, honestly, I hadn't seen Beastmaster in a long time, like a long time, and I didn't realize until this viewing just how fucking metal it is. This movie kicks Conan's ass. It's chock full of so many strange but compelling visuals, Rip Torn's prosthetic nose, this scrot tree, bat people cults, lots of bodies impaled on sticks, casual child sacrifice, the world's grossest ring pop, some quality dungeon antics, one of the evil bikers from Mandy, and so, so much more. This film is a moving heavy metal album cover, and during the, this, this movie, I, I went from fondish memories to full on love in this flick. Beastmaster fucking rules, and I am so happy that more people get to experience it as part of such a fantastic package. Fucking, fucking stellar shit. Now let's talk about the extras. Uh, the new commentary with Don Coscarelli and writer-producer Paul Pepperman, moderated by Joe Lynch, is great fun and very informative. We also get an archival commentary by Don Coscarelli and Paul Pepperman, uh, which I didn't listen to, but it's nice to have. I'm sure it's great. Uh, the Beastmaster Chronicles is a making-of documentary that runs a little over 80 minutes and delves into the history and process of making the film, with new interviews featuring the likes of Don Coscarelli, Mark Singer, Paul Pepperman, Adam Wingard, uh, Paul, uh, Joe Lynch, and various cast and crew from Beastmaster, uh, including the Animal Trainer. It's great work. 
It's no Spookies documentary, but it's a hell of a good production, especially considering, well, literally all of 2020. The archival documentary, The Saga of the Beastmaster, runs 55 minutes and works as a perfect companion piece to the new doc. Uh, next up, we have 27 minutes of Super 8mm Home Movies by James Dodson, with commentary by Coscarelli and Peppermint, so we get a lot of uh, just shit from behind the scenes, which is super cool to see. Then there's the alternate updated visual effects version supervised by Coscarelli. This does have a small glitch about five minutes in where the image freezes up a bit. I didn't watch much beyond that, so I don't really have an opinion on the whole thing, but I'm hoping that Vinegar Syndrome takes care of that. I know for a fact that several other people have had this problem with the glitch. Uh, I'm not going to send them anything until, again, they've, they've at least opened the site back up. Uh, there's a little over two minutes of outtakes, mostly consisting of TNA, which was surprising. And we round that out with a stills gallery and the original theatrical trailer, as is the totally gangster way of doing things. And yeah, that's it. That is that is uh, the Vinegar Syndrome uh, November Black Friday, whatever you want to call it, package. Uh, I am thoroughly impressed, you guys. Like, I... I, I, I can't say I'm shocked because it, it's been a long time since Vinegar Syndrome was actually able to shock me with the quality of a release, but like the VSU line, if this is what they're all like, holy butts. Like I am super excited to buy those. Of course, uh, you do have to buy them separately if you're a subscriber going forward. This one is included uh, with the subscriber package for 2020, but 2021, uh, not going to be a part of the package. Uh, Fade to Black, of course, so great. I love Silent Madness. I love Don't Pan. I love all these movies, really. Like, they're all, like there's not a single movie here I would not recommend. I'm also really glad I didn't include the VSAs, because this video is, uh, let's see, running very long, as the kids say. So, yeah, I'm not going to keep you guys any longer. Thanks for watching the stack. Uh, this is our stack for the day. Pretty fucking sick. Quite like it. Uh, can't wait to talk to you next time. Thank you so much. Don't forget to check out the merch store down below. We got some crazy shit in there. Uh, if you feel like helping me out with these videos, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, Pilgrim, I don't know why I said it that way. Uh, you can join me on Patreon, and we have a cool Discord. Lots of fun talking movies and junk. And yeah, guys, go watch a movie.